Hey, and welcome back. I'm Max Duran, and this is my show, Making Metal with Max. Today's episode is going to be a continuation of Metallurgy, talking about BCC and FCC. Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Max. Uh, today's show is going to be fun. We're going to be continuing on with uh, Metallurgy. Metallurgy turned into a big thing. We're on episode four and I think we got one more episode coming up. Uh, I hope you guys have fun. I've been getting great emails from you guys. I really appreciate the contact and the reaching out. I like the comments on Facebook. I like the comments on uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram and how you guys are getting a hold of me by email. Ask Max at cwbgroup.org. It's a great way to get a hold of me. I will try to get back to you as fast as I can, but things are tough and school's going to be starting back up soon. So, you know, making the best of what we can, right? So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about BCC and FCC and what those terms mean and why it matters and why it's important. One of the things that gets lost often with this is in the technical jargon is the why. And I like to start every show with why, and I think you guys know that now. And why do we need to know about BCC, FCC, or HCP, or any of these other crystalline structures that uh, exist in metallurgy? Well, a lot of the things that we've been talking about lead up to this point. Uh, the science of metallurgy is, uh, is very broad, and it can get from a very rudimentary uh, understanding of how steel feels, and, and sounds, and, and burns, and melts, to the atomic structures in, in a chemistry lab where I'm working with these materials. And everything that we've taken at every step is valuable now. So we're talking about ductility, malleability, hardnesses, tensile strengths, torsion strengths, um, the ability to mix certain steels together, why you can, why you can't, uh, my grain migration, all that stuff that we've talked about at different points leads to the BCC, FCC conversation. All right, so first of all, why? Well, we need to know how to build things when we're making metals, right? We know that. So... We, we also need to know how to make those metals. Now, in order to make metals and make alloys now, it's not like a, a scientist or a person, a metallurgist, comes into an office with a blank slate and says, oh, here's my periodic tables. I'm just going to throw some things together and see what happens. No. When someone says, look, I need steel. It needs to be X amount of strong, strength and heat resistance because I'm going into outer space. Uh, the metallurgist will have a clear understanding of what every metal will do on its own and in relationship to another. Now you can figure that stuff out atomically. You can figure it out by its grain structure. So why do we need to know this? It's because we will. it will tell us how steels will react. It'll tell us whether they're gonna be soft or hard, whether they melt well or not, or the general term weldability, how easily formable, shapeable, bendable, and weldable is this material, okay? So let's start at the top. With lattice we've talked about lattice a few times and there's really complex ways to get into this I had an email saying you know can you get a little bit more um, uh, into the material a little bit more complex and I don't know if this is the place for that I can maybe do follow-up shows that might be fun but uh, you know there's actually like way more out there than I understand but I love this stuff so the lattice we under we went over it over the last couple shows is kind of how atoms line up right and now an important thing to understand about the lining up of these lattices is that it affects the electrical and uh, thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity. Conductivity. Okay? Now, that's because if it aligns a certain way, electricity can get through its path well and with the least amount of loss and the least amount of resistance. All right. Now, if, electric, if electricity can pass through well, so can heat. Now, these are both in the bubble of energy. Now, it's important to note that energy is a lot of things. When it comes to metals or materials, you'll have your thermal energy, your electrical energy. But then you have gravity. You have its internal gravity, which is its own, you know, uh, ability to create gravity. Because everything that spins and has mass has gravity, right? Um you have different distortions, you have res residual stresses. All of these things are different forms of energy, 
that uh, will have an effect on your material, okay? Now, when I'm putting together my lattice, the way these align naturally affects how well it deals with energy, okay? Now, the next thing we need to know is how well they hold on to each other. So we talked about there being an atom living inside of each of these boxes. Well, inside of these boxes, there's bonds, right? They're bonds, they're bonding to each other. That gravity, that magnetism, it helps it hold on to its neighbor. And that creates that metal, that hard metal at a frozen temperature, which is, you know, livable for us when steel's hard. And that's why it's good material for us to use. It holds on to itself, it's forable, it's ductile, it's malleable, it's all these wonderful things. Now, every material on the periodic table, but specifically the metals, will have a, uh, an alignment and a bond within its lattice that allows it to conduct energy in some regard while maintaining attributes. That's always a good trade-off, that I can hammer this, but it can also build and melt and re-harden and be usable and not dissipate or fly away. It'll revert back to its original state that we started with, if done properly. All right? So we understand that there's this bond, there's this electrical uh, conductivity or energy conductivity, and that there's an alignment within it. Next, when we add to that, this conversation, what we need to discuss is energy. Okay, so energy is a lot of things. We just went over that. It's a lot of stuff. It can be a lot of different variables. Now, how a material deals with energy is very important. We like metals because they deal with energy generally pretty well. Okay, uh, if we look at types of energy, maybe you guys will recognize this little trinket. If you've been to the shrink or a doctor, uh, or you see it in movies, it's a metal ball, you pull back on it, you let go, then it ticks back and forth, okay? Now that's called Newton's cradle, Newton's cradle, Oop, cradle, and it's basically an instrument to, dis to show you kinetic energy. When I pull this ball back up to here, okay, I'm pulling it up and then gravity is going to want to pull it back down, right? We know that. These are all hanging at a state of rest because gravity's pulled them on the end of their string and they can't go anywhere. Well, this one's out of the loop and it got pulled up. And when I let go of it, that gravity is going to pull down on it and put energy. It's actually placing energy into that mass. That gravitational pull is giving it motion now it's moving because gravity pulled it right when this hits this its energy has converted from gravity to kinetic that gravity is boom here now it's k into there kinetic into there kinetic into there kinetic into there and then this ball will come up and fight gravity the energy stored in won't be lost it'll be converted and then it comes back out Okay, now that's important to understand in all materials. Energy can be transitioned. It can be moved around. It doesn't necessarily get weaker. There's really no reason to lose energy unless it's being converted into other forms of energy that make it seem like there's a loss. Like electrical, electricity doesn't get lost from A to B. It gets lost in heat. Then that heat gets spent out into, the, into nature and the atmosphere gains that energy, which then goes on somewhere else. That energy is constantly everywhere. It's just changing forms, okay? Now, that's pretty important when it comes to metal also because when you get to certain types of uh, processes, say like plasma or ionization, you're going to be talking about how uh, energy is uh, passed along really well in situations where maybe it shouldn't be. Well, when something is ionized, it's almost like that kinetic energy. It's become a, a material now that can pass off energy well, okay? Now, if I put this energy on a scale, as you notice, I use a lot of scales, and here I have very low energy. So low energy would be not a lot of input, not a lot, not a lot of electricity. And in this term, on this scale, what I'm going to be talking about here is heat. Okay? Now, there's no such thing as a cool scale. Everything's a heat scale, right? So coolness is just the absence of heat. So when I'm cold or not hot, at a very low energy, I have a solid. Now, this means that it's frozen, right? Water freezes at zero, well, steel freezes at 900. You know, so that's, that's, it is what it is. It's, every material has its own thing. So, I add some heat, some fire, 
and then it turns into a gas. Okay? Oh, sorry. Liquid. I missed one there. Liquid. Once I get to a liquid, now things are moving around. Things are a little bit more shaky. I got a little bit of liquidy. I add more heat. I get to a gas, right? Now things are really moving. And if I go to the fourth state of matter here, I have plasma. Now, why is it important to understand the, the states of matter? Well, because this has to do with transferage of energy. So I have uh, heat. I have almost no heat, right? Things are solid. I add heat, things get liquid. I add heat, they go to gas. I add heat, it goes to a plasma. And what's happening to my atomic structure? Here, I'm frozen. There's no motion happening. Things aren't moving. Everything's kind of dead in the water. Now, if I'm looking at this in terms of a lattice, I have everything just chill. So that's, that's your little atom sitting in the center of his box, just, just chilling out. That's what we call BCC. Okay. That's body centered cubic. Okay. Now from here, we start adding a little bit of heat. And what happens is that in that box, right? That guy starts getting agitated and agitated and agitated. And somewhere in here, okay, between solid to liquid, because liquid's like all the way, between there, what we hit is a thing called FCC. And what's happening here, and I'll draw it a little bit better in a bit, is that it's got so much energy that it's starting to move around. The bonds are getting a little bit weaker. Then we get too much and a liquid and they start to get loose. Right, the bonds get hard, more separated. Gas, the bonds are far away, and a plasma, well, it's a whole nother thing. There's so much energy that the bonds are just spatial apart. Okay, now if you look at this terrible alignment of drawings that I've done for you, you can see that this will affect the ability to transfer energy. I add energy to create these things, but now how's my conductivity on a solid? It's good because my bonds are tight and stable. And now things can pass through there without much obstruction. I get a little bit higher and I get all the way to liquid and you see I have a gap now. Things are loose. Electricity does not transfer well through there. I get through gas. Well, it's real hard for electricity to jump the gap. And then plasma, I need so much juice that I to make that transfer electricity that it's almost unreal, okay? So energy in, Things space out, which affects how well it conducts electricity, okay? So we talked about the energy, states of matter, and how it matters, right? Then we start talking about the actual construction of the BCC molecule. So this is uh, body-centered, okay? That means that I am pulled. Okay, I have a low amount of energy invested into my structure and I'm just hanging out. My bonds are strong. Everyone's happy in their little house. They're all little happy guys in their house. Iron lives at frozen temperature in BCC. It's a nice, happy molecule. It uh, holds on well. Okay, over here we're going to have FCC, which is face-centered. And what's happening here, once I get my drawings done, is that I've invested so much energy. Remember, heat energy. Okay, this is my fire. Heat energy is going in. And what happens is that this guy starts getting agitated. Now, we learned that in, in I think, grade school, that when you add heat to an atom, it starts to move around. Okay, it's how microwaves work for heating up water. Okay, so we're, we're, we're agitating the, mo the molecule or the, the nucleus by adding energy. Eventually, I'll start moving this guy so much that the house is starting to rumble, right? The, the house is starting to bang around because I got a, a, a basically a high energy guy starting to push his boundaries. Electrons are centered around it. It's a magnetic sphere. And what happens is the atom can live in there. The nucleus can live in there. But as it puts strain on those boundaries, it starts to move it, okay? 
that movement starts to weaken these bonds, which makes the material easier to move and bend, right? Iron, I add a little bit of heat and it starts getting bendy, right? It starts getting easier to form. I get to a certain point where I've added so much heat that my guy in the center is actually starting to now compromise his boundaries, okay? There's so much energy in here that this guy's going nuts. And what he's starting to do now is he's actually coming up to his limit, which is the guy beside him. It's his fence, right? And he's hitting that limit. And that guy is just as excited and he's kind of hitting back, right? And what happens now is that once we go past FCC, these bonds will start to break apart. And that's when you go into liquid. Okay, the big L over here. Between here and here is kind of where the magic happens for almost all our iron chemistry. When we're talking about tempering or heat treating, everything we're doing is either below critical temperature or above critical temperature. Those are the conversations that we have. And that's based on the amount of energy stored within that iron. Now, an interesting thing happens. As you go from BCC to FCC, this guy's hyped, man. Like, he's hyped up on energy. So the, he actually conducts electricity pretty damn good. And in most instances, FCC substances are better conductors than BCC substances. So iron at a totally cold state does not conduct electricity that well. I warm it up a little bit and it starts to conduct electricity a lot better. And we know this as welders inadvertently because we weld one pass and it doesn't weld very good because it's cold. The next pass just lays in like butter because everything's warmed up and now the electrical pathways are just relaxed, right? Up to a point. As soon as they start to break apart, that conductivity is done. You get to a gas and it's over, a liquid and it's over. So you can only go so far and this is the game you play. When you go past this, you have to be able to mitigate the cooling, the expansions. You have to really watch the alloys and the grain migration. Inside of here, you can do a lot without damaging that. All right? So body-centered cubic, low energy, happy rest time. FCC, overloaded, hyper time energy guy. All right? So how does that play out with other elements? Well, if I want to make an alloy, let's say I want to make an alloy. And I start with an Fe, which is a BCC. Okay, we know what that reacts like. We know what that what that's like. FCC, BCC, and HCP, which is hexagon closed packed materials, all also have uh, their own ductility malleability rates. Okay. Now this Fe at a BCC is pretty good. I like it for certain materials. But you know what? I want to make it harder. Okay. So I want to make it harder. Well, what's a really good hard element? Okay, chrome. Chrome is really tight molecule and I can add chrome. It's also a BCC. Now these conduct electricity about the same, but you know what? Let's add some nickel and that's an FCC. This conducts even a little bit better than these two, but what this one does is that it disrupts the lattice. You put these three together, I get stainless steel. Wow. Now stainless steel is all a mix of chrome and nickel with iron at various levels. But how you play with these alignments and bonds now is what happens in the steel. Stainless steel is very hard. It's very, very uh, durable. It's wear resistant. It doesn't oxidize like other materials because of the disruption in the lattice. It won't let it oxidize. But that disruption in the lattice also doesn't let it conduct electricity worth a damn. Okay. Now, even though nickel is better because it lives in an FCC state, nickel is a naturally hyped up molecule and conducts electricity really well. Well, when I mix it into this mix, it kind of just all goes burr, 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 and it goes bad. Now, bad in this instance is good for us as welders or as a material because it's now not going to corrode because it doesn't play nice with oxygen or hydrogen. It's not going to have other issues and it's going to be good and hard and and uh, somewhat bendy, but it's going to have some of the attributes of all these elements, okay? Now, it's important to note, BCC, FCC, HCP, uh, that they all have different ductility and malleability ratios, right? Now, along with that, there's conductivity ratios. So, FCCs tend to conduct better. Their ductility and their malleability are also much different than things that reside in the BCC world at, a, at the same state. 
right? Which are going to conduct worse, but they're going to have different ductility and malleability ratios. And HCPU, that's a whole other ball game, right? They tend to not conduct very electricity very well at all. So that's going to have a different effect. Okay. So I think that's about it. I haven't tried to get too deep into any of these, but just know that body centered cubic materials, which is a large portion of the metals are, are good for us because they're a nice, easy material to work with. Okay. They have a good ductility ratio. They're not overly conductive, which makes them pretty good to weld at low temperatures. If you get too conductive, it's hard to weld like copper and aluminum because then you need too much energy to weld them. Well, these don't need a lot of energy to weld them. Now, FCCs, we know that you go up that level and we start getting a little bit hotter and things are good, good, good. And then there's a cap, right? Before we go liquid or austenitic, where now you do not, you do not conduct electricity anymore. And HCP is another state that you can peek into. So depending on the materials, some will get there through the heat spectrum. Some materials will always live in one spot, no matter how you heat it or cool it. Some will go through two or three phase changes. So it really depends on the material. Super interesting, there's great links out there, there's great diagrams, there's a great periodic table that I found on Google that shows the crystal structures for each, each atom. And that's really fun. I'll see if I can get the guys, my post editing guys to put it up for us. So anyways, I think that's about it. Next week we're gonna get into classifications. I've had lots of questions about uh, rods, designations, fluxes, uh, how to order steel, what the numbers mean. And I think that's some good, valid questions. We need to know that stuff. And uh, although it can be quite confusing, especially when you're looking at different countries or international standards, there's a lot of different numbers out there and it can get pretty crazy. Um, thanks to the emails again from people. Thanks to my pro production team. Thanks for CWB uh, Acorn for helping us out. They always do a great job for me. Thanks to the people on YouTube that are following. I, I appreciate it. Thanks to the CWB Association. Sign up for your membership, please. Go to the association website. It's on the CWB group site. Go to association. I'm in the Regina chapter. And uh, if you got any emails, ask me at askmax at cwbgroup.org or shoot me a message on Instagram, kingmaxo75. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Take care.